If you're working with laser beams, especially in interferometry, you're going to need a laser beam with a diameter that is considerably larger than that produced by, well, a laser. A beam expander provides such a large diameter beam by using two groups of lenses. The first group is used to expand the beam, and the second group is used to collimate the beam. The two types of beam expanders are the Galilean telescope, which brings in a beam of one size, expands it with the diverging expander, and then collimates it with the converging collimator. The Keplerian telescope uses two converging lenses where the first lens focuses the light to the focal point of the second lens so that it emerges from the second lens fully collimated. Two operational characteristics might stand out immediately. The first is that the Galilean beam expander will give an upright image of the incoming laser beam, and the Keplerian beam expander will produce an inverted image. A second distinction has to do with common sense laser safety. Looking at what happens to rays passing through a Keplerian telescope, between the two lens groups, there's a point where all of the light energy focuses, ideally to a single point. What saves it from focusing to a single point is diffraction as well as aberration from the first lens. But nevertheless, with a high power laser, you can expect to see ionization of the air at that point, dust particles igniting, and enhanced wavefront aberration due to heating of the air causing the index of refraction at that point to change. If the idea is to have a product which takes a narrow laser beam and gives you a wide laser beam, or vice versa, then it's worthwhile to go shopping. When you go shopping around the internet, you find several websites. The first one I came across was the Keoptic website, boasting beam expanders with two adjustments, one for the magnification and one for the divergence, or convergence of the output beam. You can control that divergence, you may not want it to be perfectly collimated, and you have a say in that by adjusting it with these two adjustment rings, one of which adjusts the magnification and one adjusts the collimation. And the same is the case with the Thor Labs product. You have these two rings on all of them which adjust the magnification and the collimation of the outgoing beam. An important point is made by the listings on the Edmund Optics website. No matter who makes them, beam expanders have a defined bandwidth. And narrow band beam expanders are usually confined to UV vis or vis or near infrared or near infrared vis. They are limited in their band because of the anti reflective coating on the lenses. And another important distinction among beam expanders, which is true for all vendors, is that the lens that is moved to adjust the divergence is moved either on a linear motion mechanism or on a rotating motion mechanism. If you move lenses by rotating them on a screw type mechanism, you end up with the possibility of beam wander. And so a higher end product uses non rotating adjustments. I have two beam expanders. The short one is about six centimeters long, and if you look through it, you can tell if it's Keplerian or Galilean. It's upright, therefore it is Galilean. I can move my hand up, move my hand down, my hand goes up or down, you see it going up or down. In the second beam expander, much longer, it's about 18 centimeters long. If you look through that, maybe you can see my upside down head all the way through the other end. And again, I move my hand down, then up, and you see it clearly going the other way in the image. Now, these are low-cost beam expanders. You can tell from the telescope couplings on them that they're meant for something else. They don't have the adjustment rings, but they're what I use in my lab. I'll spend the rest of my time on the Galilean telescope with two lens groups, and the first one is negative and the second one is positive. The reason why I say groups is because it really could be more than one lens making that diverging lens and more than one lens making that converging lens. The separation is the sum of the focal lengths. One of these f's is negative and one is positive. The minus sign is included in this variable. The expansion ratio is the magnifying power of the system. It is how much bigger the beam gets. And it equals minus the ratio of the focal lengths of the two lenses. The beam coming in has a radius of y1, and when it comes out it has a radius of y2. And that, of course, is of considerable interest since achieving y2 is the objective of the device. A beam expander is referred to as a focal because its focal length is undefined. Or as you used to be able to say, the focal length is infinity. You can still calculate an infinite focal length, it's just its inverse is zero. Let's use thin lenses at first. Phi1 is the power of the first lens, and Phi2 is the power of the second lens. N is the refractive index between the two lenses. D is their separation. 
Replacing the phi's, the powers, with one over the focal lengths gives a nice working equation for where you need to set d given what f1 and f2 are. The sum of the focal lengths is d. One consequence of having an undefined focal length is that you don't have a very good field of view. But if you consider light being brought in at a field angle, another term can be defined that has to do with the magnification. U1 is the incoming angle, and U2 is the outgoing angle. The intuitive definition of magnification is Y2 divided by Y1, but it can also be written in terms of the focal lengths, and it can be written in terms of those angles. Y2 over Y1 equals U1 over U2, and that is 1 divided by the angular magnification. A mag is the operand in Z max for U2 divided by U1. The important thing is that in the limit that U1 goes to 0, well, U2 goes to 0 as well, and you still have an angular magnification that you can talk about. No beam is perfectly collimated coming out of a laser, even. You do have some amount of beam divergence for the incoming beam. And a benefit of a beam expander is that the divergence is reduced as the beam is expanded, and it is reduced by that magnification power. The outermost beam in the ray is offset from the normal by the angle U, and when it comes out of the beam expander, that angle has been reduced by the magnifying power. So the beam expansion also equals the reduction in the beam divergence. Let's design a Galilean telescope. We want a factor of 10 beam expansion. We'll set the total track length to 130 millimeters, and we'll have an output beam diameter of 10 millimeters which means that the input beam has a diameter of 1 millimeter. The topology of a Galilean telescope is a diverging lens group followed by a converging lens group. Call the thicknesses T1 and T2 and call the lens separation D. We'll use a refractive index of 1.52. And so the focal lengths F1 plus F2 plus the thicknesses of the lenses need to add up to that track length of 130 millimeters. Let's use a thickness of 2 millimeters on both lenses so that the separation between the lenses will be 126 millimeters. And another working equation comes from magnification, which is F2 over F1. So the focal length F2 is minus 10 times F1. That gives two equations and two unknowns, which can be quickly solved for F1 and F2. If the system is designed such that the diverging lens has a focal length of minus 14 millimeters and the converging lens 140 millimeters, the beam should come out with a magnification of 10 and well collimated. I will design the Galilean telescope as simply as possible so that each lens group has only one lens in it, and the first lens will be equiconcave and the second lens will be equiconvex. So the power of lens 1 is n minus 1 times 2 over its radius of curvature, and the power of lens 2 is its n minus 1 times 2 divided by its radius of curvature. Solve both of those for the radii of curvature, and go into the YNU spreadsheet in Excel and use these numbers to analyze this setup and see if it is a beam expander with an expansion ratio of 10. To see how the YNU spreadsheet is constructed, see my video on how to construct a YNU spreadsheet. Column C is the object column, and I set the thickness to a billion so that the object can be at infinity. And the refractive index is 1 because it's air. We'll bring the marginal ray in at 0.5 millimeters above the optical axis, which means that when it comes out, it will be at 5 millimeters above. It has an incoming angle of 0. We don't have to be concerned about the chief ray until we get to aberration calculations later. Put in the radii of curvatures that we just calculated for the two lenses. The surface powers are automatically calculated. Using the paraxial ray trace equations for refraction at the surface and transfer between surfaces, the height of the marginal ray at the output of lens 1 and at the input of lens 2 and the output of lens 2 can be calculated as well as the angles. There is an angle of refraction after the first surface and the second, third, and fourth surface as well. The incident angle of the chief ray is used to calculate the chief ray invariance that we can calculate coma. The output angle at surface 4 of the marginal ray should be 0 if it's perfectly collimated. The output angle is minus 1.7 times 10 to the minus 4 radians. That is the output collimation. The beam expansion ratio, which is the height of the output beam at the fourth surface divided by its height coming in at the first surface, 
is 10.3, not 10.0. So it's not exactly as designed, but that's okay. Playing around with the separation between the two lenses and the curvature of lens 1, optimal collimation results with a radius of curvature of 15 millimeters and lens separation of 125.6 millimeters. 4 times 10 to the minus 13 radians. You can send a beam with that divergence to the moon and back and its diameter will be barely changed. If this beam expander is actually going to be used as a telescope, or if it's going to be used with a high-speed laser so that there is a broad spectrum, then it would make sense to use achromatic lenses. Do the whole thing all over again where lens 1 is replaced with lens group 1, which includes lens 1 and lens 2, and lens 2 is replaced with lens group 2, which includes lens 3 and lens 4. These are achromatic doublets, and if you want to see how that's designed, you can see my video on axial color. I designed each achromatic doublet separately in order to ensure that they're actually achromatic. And that's a simple matter of playing around with the radii of curvature until zero axial color is achieved. Then I assembled the two doublets in this spreadsheet and I adjusted the separation between them until I had two things. The expansion ratio was exactly 10 because that's what I designed for and the collimation was 10 to the minus 10. Very well collimated. This nearly perfect output collimation is sensitive to the separation between the two lens groups. For example, if the 119.73 separation was reduced by 1 millimeter, watch what happens to the 9.9 .9 times 10 minus 11 output beam divergence. It changes dramatically. After that, it doesn't change so much, but 2 times 10 minus 4 is still good enough for a lot of laboratory uses. Over a distance of 10 meters, the beam will get wider by 5 millimeters. That's not nearly as good collimation, but effective for very short distance applications. Now, the divergence was tunable in these commercial beam expanders. To do this, the radii on the second lens group need to be adjustable because when you change the magnifying power, you change the divergence. But it's not practical to adjust the radii of curvature of lenses. So instead, put another lens in between that accomplishes collimation. And that's this lens 3, the magenta group here. It's only one single lens. What I found after about an hour of tinkering was that I could get the expansion ratio to be exactly 10, and then upon adjusting the separation, I could get the expansion ratio to be exactly 5, and I moved the collimating lens around. And the best I could do is 2 times 10 to the minus 2. The reason why was because the radii of curvature aren't ideal for this. It's time to put this into your lens design software and optimize the radii so that you can move this collimating lens back and forth at a variety of expansion ratios. So finalize this design using lens design software with a multi-configuration editor. I can't do that in Excel, and my ZMAX license has expired, so I can't be doing that in ZMAX right now either. So the beam expansion ratio is controlled by the separation between the two lens groups. You can also say it's controlled by the power of lens 1, which you can adjust during the design, but in operation you can't turn a ring and change the power of the lens group. The collimation is controlled by the power of the second lens group. Make it stronger, the rays will converge. Make it weaker, the rays will diverge. There is an ideal power for that second lens group. But you can't change that on the fly. So with a collimating lens in between that can be slid back and forth, you can keep the output beam from diverging. Hopefully this video gave you some insight into how beam expanders work and the design philosophy behind them.